So today, so today we're talking about the uh, hydrocortisone uh, therapy in uh, trauma patients. So obviously, as we all know, the pendulum on hydrocortisone and corticosteroids has sort of swung back and forth. So uh, this is another look or another take at sort of this whole uh, use of corticosteroids in sick patients. In the past, obviously, we know it's been done in septic patients, but this is looking at it in uh, multiple trauma patients. So this is a group that was done, um, this uh, study was done in France uh, by uh, a few ICU centers. So as an introduction, of course, we all know that severe trauma is a major cause of death in both developing and developed countries. So definitely pertain to our own practice here in London, Ontario, but also really around the world, um, whether it's MVCs or, or um, or uh, fights or assaults or anything like that, definitely a major cause of death. And of course, we also know that pneumonia in the post-trauma setting in the ICU uh, is, is definitely has a high prevalence. So in various um, settings, whether the person is colonized with bacteria, whether they aspirated uh, during or prior to intubation, length of ICU stay, all of that that is up there is um, a potential risk factor for developing hospital-associated pneumonia or nosocomial pneumonia. So we know that in, in trauma, they might have a persistent systemic inflammatory phase. So, and we know that that's related. Uh, the actual pathophysiology of that is, is not quite teased out, but we know that that's um, a potential association. And that um, there has been discussed in the literature that there's a, a certain sense of cortical insufficiency in people that have, um, that are in trauma. And again, the real reason as to why they're corticosteroid insufficient uh, is, is up for debate by most uh, experts. And essentially the idea here, here is to use corticosteroids or, cortical, um, or hydrocortisone to attenuate the overwhelming response. So how can we get the immune system to function normally without going out of whack to be able to, um, to prevent uh, illness and, and hopefully uh, improve morbidity and mortality for the patient? So steroid use, in normal person, in, in you and I who are not under a lot of stress, although preparing for general club is stressful, so I'm probably at 300 milligrams per day. But in most of us, it's probably between 15 to 25 milligrams per day is a normal production. And um, at a stress level, whether it's trauma or illness or sepsis or, or disease, this can go up to 300 milligrams per day as a stress dose. And the idea of using a stress dose corticosteroid in trauma patients or septic patients is that you essentially want to increase the immune response, whether it's to increase the neutrophil activity, uh, increase your function of your dendritic cells, and also to um, attenuate the, the natural native inflammatory response secondary to trauma or illness to be able to allow the native immune system to function at its best. So this has been done before in terms of, like I said, in septic patients. So back in the early 2000s, there was a study uh, with a similar group, also in France, that showed that low-dose corticosteroids reduce the rate of death in septic shock. We also know that in 2008, Sprung and al. also did a study that showed that corticosteroids did not improve survival in shock. This was otherwise known as the cortico study that I think a lot of us are well familiar with. So the pendulum on this idea of using corticosteroids or not has definitely swung back and forth. So in, initially, it said no corticosteroids. And then subsequently it says yes to, or I mean yes to corticosteroids, subsequently no. And then now I would say this study uh, is a, a bit of a supporter for the use of corticosteroids, which we'll talk about in the end. So the research question, the key message in this study essentially is, does the treatment with corticosteroids or stress dose steroids diminish the risk of pneumonia in multi-trauma patients? So that's the question that they're asking in this study. And the primary outcome prior to their analysis, their a priori primary outcome is hospital acquired or hospital associated pneumonia at 28 days. So within this 28 day trial, what is the likelihood of someone uh, who is in the multi-trauma setting going to get pneumonia? And some of the secondary outcomes they included included um, duration of mechanical ventilation or otherwise mechanical ventilation free days, uh, length of ICU stay, and also rates of death but all of these are secondary outcomes and not their, their intentional question in the beginning. So the method, uh, the inclusion was interesting. Uh, they used uh, people age 15 and three months. The three month, I don't know how they got the three month from, but it, it, that, that was their inclusion criteria. And then subsequently, uh, they have to be expected to be on mechanical ventilation for greater than 48 hours. And they have to be in multi-trauma setting, uh, two or more injuries and uh, injury severity score of greater than 15. Uh, and the total score uh, possible for a person is 75, if we remember from trauma. And the exclusion is um, 
uh, any of these sort of obvious things to all of us, anybody with predisposed adrenal insufficiency, immunosuppressed, use of steroids, pregnancy, uh, were excluded. So the study design was a multi-centered randomized blinded trial. It was done in Angers, France, in seven ICU centers. The demographics of the hydrocortisone group and the placebo group, I would say, is roughly similar, which we'll show you in the, in the graph setting in a second. And then both groups were treated equally uh, in terms of they all went through the protocol, the only difference being one received the, the placebo and the other person received the hydrocortisone. And only one person did not complete the whole study and they just withdrew uh, consent uh, halfway through. But they were analyzed as intent to treat and they weren't left out of the final analysis. So another important definition to talk about prior to the, the uh, results is how they define pneumonia. So pneumonia for them was defined as two of these three criteria that I listed on the top. So if they had a temperature, if they had a, a white count, whether they were too low or too high, and purulent secretions associated with associated um, x-ray changes. So when you have two of those things, so they screen their patients uh, twice a day, and if you had two of those three things, then you were screened to have potential hospital-associated pneumonia. And subsequently, this was confirmed by culture, whether it was uh, a bronchoscopy, lavage, uh, or just a, a suction sputum, uh, et cetera. And they also did a test before you were included into the study, or, or you were included into the study, but the second you were included, they did this test of uh, insufficiency. So what they did was they took your, your basal um, total cortisol level in your blood, so the corticosemia level, um, and then subsequently gave you a dose of corticotropin and then measured your, your stress response to that. And they defined it as less than 15, as your, if you tested less than 15 at baseline, or if you had a delta of less than nine, 60 minutes after the test, then you were, you were said to be insufficient in terms of corticosteroids. And basically that just illustrates that um, that was done. So a 0.25 milligram dose was given and measured at 30 and 60 minutes post uh, test. So if you were the person that had the um, adapted response, basically meaning that you did produce enough corticosteroids to give you a, a delta of greater than nine, then you did not get the, the treatment. So if you're in the placebo group, you would stop getting placebo. If you were in the hydrocortisone group, you would not be getting hydrocortisone. However, you would still be tracked for the next 28 days to see if you got pneumonia or not. So you're still in that protocol group, whichever you were randomized to be in. And then if you were in the placebo or hydrocortisone group, you would get um, seven days worth of, of medication, 20 mill 200 milligrams per day for five days, and then subsequently tapered down to 50 milligrams per day on the seventh day. Oops. So just to illustrate sort of how this works, it it's probably a little bit easier looking at a graph. So initially they had about 700 uh, people that they thought uh, may be eligible. The majority of them, 569 or so, were excluded, mainly because they didn't meet the inclusion criteria. But the key is 150 of these people were randomized. So this is the um, hydrocortisone group, and then subsequently this is the randomized to the um, placebo group. And then when they brought these people uh, through their protocol, um, 57 of these 74 subsequently was deemed to have corticosteroid insufficiency, and then 17 had an adapted response, which means that of this group, 57 got the hydrocortisone all the way through, and this group were just followed but did not get hydrocortisone. This group here, 57 out of 76, um, uh, had uh, an insufficiency when they did the corticotropin test. 57 got the placebo all the way through, whereas 19 of the 76 did, not, uh, did have an adapted response and therefore did not get placebo uh, all the way through. But these groups, 74, 76, were carried through all the way, no difference other than the um, ones getting placebo and ones getting hydrocortisone. If we look at the general characteristics of these two groups, so if you look at this, this shows you all patients. So this is the 74 or 70, uh, 70 I guess that should have been 74, and this is 76. Uh, patients in the placebo group, 
on your right hand side you'll see this chart here. This basically shows you the um, subgroup analysis. So these are the people that, are, that had uh, insufficient response, so, so the 56 that I was talking about, and then the 57 which had the insufficiency, the corticosteroid insufficiency that received the placebo group. And this is the group where they grouped together all the people in both placebo and hydrocortisone that had the adapted response, and this is the data there. If you look at just the general characteristics, it seems that their age was similar all the way through. The majority of these patients were men, which is consistent with what we see in trauma. And then all the other characteristics that we see is essentially the same. Of course, the, the corticotropin test in the adapted response would be higher, which you would respect, res expect because they had an adapted response. So essentially the data analysis was done initially with the Kaplan-Meier survival analysis. And this was essentially used to determine whether there was a probability uh, of developing hospital associate uh, pneumonia within the two groups. So basically what this shows you is that the important take home message from this graph is, of course, there's a difference between these two curves, the bottom being the hydrocortisone, the top being the uh, placebo. So if you look at, at any given point in the um, 28 days, the, the, there is a difference in the probability of you getting pneumonia in the um, placebo versus the hydrocortisone group. And because of this distribution uh, of this curve, this allowed us to analyze the data in a certain way, which we'll talk about. So the final a posteriori primary analysis consisted of the effects of hydrocortisone on the primary outcome. So the initially primary outcome was, like we talked about, was hospital associated pneumonia in 28 days. So that's what the question they were asking. But at some point during the study, uh, they somehow switched a little bit on their, their primary outcome, which is why we have the a posteriori outcome. So they used the Cox proportional hazard model and they made sure they controlled for these three factors. The research center where this was, where um, the, the patients came from, the presence or absence of traumatic brain injury, and also in uh, injury severity scores. So in those that are 15 to 30 versus those that are 30 or more, they made sure they controlled for that. So at some point they switched their, their primary um, outcome a little bit, um, but we're not sure why. So the results of this study, the primary outcome is that all patients, in all patients, so the 73 and the 76, 35.6% uh, of them developed um, pneumonia in the hydrocortisone group, and then 51% uh, of them developed it in the placebo group, and the hazard ratio was 0.51, basically meaning that in the 28 days, at any point, there's um, a 50%, uh, the half is likely in the placebo group at half as likely in the hydrocortisone group as in the placebo group of developing pneumonia. So if you were in the hydrocortisone group, you're half as likely at any point in those 28 days to develop pneumonia. So similarly in the subgroup, uh, it was roughly the same where it was the, the group that received the hydrocortisone was less likely to develop pneumonia than the group in the placebo group. So this is the, the secondary outcome here. If you look at all of these uh, results in the mechanical ventilation free days, the development of acute lung injury or ARDS, length of ICU stay, all of these were also statistically significant uh, where the hydrocortisone group showed a decrease in uh, the need for mechanical ventilation, a decreased uh, development of a ALI or ARDS, and also a decrease in length of stay. In terms of death rate, I put an asterisk there. Uh, there was no statistical difference um, between the two groups, which means that based on what they concluded, there was no difference in death rate in the hydrocortisone group and the placebo group. But keeping in mind this is a secondary outcome and not their primary. So what did the authors interpret based on their results? So their, their message to, to uh, us is essentially hydrocortisone treatment reduced the occurrence of pneumonia within 28 days in trauma patients. So at any given point in the 28 days, if you were on a hydrocortisone group, you got a less chance of uh, developing pneumonia. You also have increased number of mechanical ventilator free days in the hydrocortisone group. You have a decreased length of ICU stay in the hydrocortisone group. And then finally, they said that there was no increase in mortality in the hydrocortisone group. So to critically appraise this article, were the patients randomized? Yes, they were randomized and blinded. The groups were the same at the start of the trial? Yes. The groups were treated equally? Yes. 
all the p patients were accounted for. Uh, yes, the one patient that we talked about withdrew consent. Um, intent to treat was used. And finally, were the outcome measures uh, objective? Yes, so they had very clear definition of pneumonia, which we talked about, and subsequent outcome assessors were blinded to the um, treatment allocation. So in our setting, would our patients at LHSE be similar to those patients? I would say yes. They're mostly going to be men, and the age for our traumas compared to the ones in France probably are likely similar. Is this feasible? Can we give people hydrocortisone in LHSE? Of course, easily available. And the benefits outweigh the harm? This is the question that I'm not sure. In terms of, is there a mortality difference or not? Was that a primary outcome? Was that simply a secondary outcome? Which we'll talk about in a second. So these are some of the comments that I had regarding the paper. Not so much as their strengths and weaknesses, but more just points of discussion. In terms of the, the methodology of the paper, I, I think it's fairly well done. The, it was fairly well thought of, and, and the statistics um, after consulting with Shelley was was there was really no major holes in that. But in terms of clinical significance, I think that's the area that we, we need to talk about a little bit. First of all is the biological plausibility of how this works. So in uh, 2008, the American College of Critical Care Medicine released a consensus that showed that um, critical illness-related cortical steroid insufficiency is a random cortisol level, total cortisol level, of less than 10. In the paper, they used 15. So even within the own authors, they said that about 15% of their patients would not meet the criteria for hydrocortisone therapy if this new definition had been used. So the reason why this has, wasn't used back in, when they did it was they started their trial in 2006, which was prior to this consensus uh, statement. So it would be interesting to, to note um, what their result would be if this was used. You would, could imagine if that there was less patients that met uh, the need for hydrocortisone, they would probably need a bigger sample size because their sample calculation based on uh, their number of 15, yielded uh, approximately 70% of people that were hydrocortisteroid insufficient. Based on this number here, perhaps only 50% of their patients would be hydrocortisone or, or uh, corticosteroid insufficient. So secondly, if we look at the idea of the um, uh, hypothalamus pituitary adrenal axis, it's very complicated. So in other people who have looked at this from a basic science and pathophysiology standpoint, in, in areas uh, or in times of stress, the um, cortisol binding globulin actually decreases. So if we're thinking of the, the free cortisol versus the total cortisol, and we're just measuring the total cortisol, we might be missing the, the actual cause of the problem. So if it decreases by 50%, up to 50% in times of stress, then the, num the amount of active cortisol, we're really not knowing because we don't really know in that patient how much this is going down by. And also, it's also been suggested that the assays are not really reproducible. So in one patient where they would do the um, uh, corticotropin test during one time of stress and do that the same time, uh, do the test again in another point in their life when they would have stress, they could have a completely different response. So it's not quite reliable as to what this test really shows. And really, we never got to the point of exploring, too, the cortisol resistance. Even if you have all the cortisol in the world in your bloodstream, what if there's a level of cortisol resistance at the level of the tissue? Then you, might not, you, you still might not get the response of, what, response of what the cortisol was supposed to do because your tissue is not really reacting to the level of cortisolcemia in your blood. The second, really, is the, the main criticism of the paper is that mortality was not the primary outcome. So it's great to know that people who get hospital-associated pneumonia is less, or, or is less likely to get it within a 28-day period, but how many of those patients actually die? And I, I don't think that given their numbers, they're able to, to adequately answer this question. So in six patients died in the hydrocortisone group, four patients died in the placebo group, uh, two of these patients died uh, initially within the first 48 hours, secondary to hemorrhage and, and bleeding. And um, subsequently, there's a couple that actually died from withdrawal of care in the ICU, so withdrawal of life-saving um, uh, equipment. So, but in any case, given this low event rate, a much larger study would have to be done to really elucidate this idea that whether mortality is benefited or decreased in uh, hydrocortisone versus control group. And given that this study was done uh, based on uh, ministry funding and, and Depar uh, Department of Health funding in France and not industry sponsored, it would be very hard to get a, a big enough budget to really uh, find this answer out.
And the last point of criticism or, or discussion is really uh, the use of fever, leukocytosis, and also x-ray findings in the screening of pneumonia. So there's been suggestions in some papers that talked about steroids as being a potential antipyretic. So basically, if, if we believe that that could be a cause, uh, being that that's two of the three criteria for screening of pneumonia, then could potentially be less patients in the hydrocortisone group be screened to actually have potential hospital-associated pneumonia in the sense that they wouldn't even be included to be cultured uh, for uh, uh, pneumonia. I, we don't know in terms of the criteria, in terms of how many people met two out of the three criteria, which two criteria they met before they screened. The paper didn't discuss that, but I think that might be interesting to know if, if this um, idea of, of basic pathophysiology or basic science uh, really stands up. And it really may decrease, like I said, the number of people included. So thank you again for your attention, and I welcome your comments. Make sure I'm understanding correctly. When they did the split, you had your high cortisone, your placebo group, and then they made sure your responders are not, and <coughs> you were able to accurately respond to the corticotropin. You got no placebo and no high cortisone, depending on which group you were in. Correct? Like, neither of them got a treatment or fake treatment, right? Correct. So if but you they were, were still analyzed as if they had. Correct. But we're not going to be doing that to our patients. We're not going to be deciding whether or not they're responders if they come into trauma. Uh, correct. So this, this was not done in MERS, this was done in ICU. So essentially what the author said was they started their treatment within 36 hours of the trial. Okay, so it was so done in ICU. Yeah, so they were all sort of triaged, taken care of, all their primary issues were dealt with, and now they're intubated in ICU. If you were going to apply this paper, if you decided that you were going to apply this paper to your patient, you would want to replicate that series of events as closely as possible. So yes, if you were thinking, oh, I, I read this paper and I think I want to apply it to this particular patient, then yes, you would do the random, the random cortisol level, you do the cosyntropin test, uh, you would apply it as, as they outlined it. Um, but this was not an early treatment like the other paper, you know, where it, where it really, you know, happened probably in the in or around the emergency department. These people, they got their their steroid treatment started up to 36 hours after their injury. So uh, that may reflect differences in the trauma system in France versus North America. It may reflect other things too. So uh, it's a little bit hard to say. But it is it is a different time frame. The point about mortality is really vital. This paper, if you look only at the primary outcome of pneumonia, showed a really good benefit. Your number needed to treat to prevent a case of, um, of ICU-associated pneumonia was only seven. So we treat for lots of things with worse number needed to treat than seven. That's actually a really great number needed to treat. But the problem is that we have no way of knowing from this paper whether or not there are more deaths when you treat with, with hydrocortisone. So um, it, it just is underpowered for that. Uh, you would need to do a study with a lot more patients that was aimed at looking at the mortality, uh, at the mortality specifically in order to know whether um, people are potentially dying from this treatment. So I think that, that as Victor said, that's a real problem with this paper. It looks like uh, it looks very convincing that you can prevent ventilator-acquired pneumonia, and that's an important outcome. It's an expensive problem. It increases people's ICU stays. It prolongs their rehabilitation. It's an important problem, but we don't know for sure from this paper whether or not we're actually making people die from this treatment. So I think that's a, a major limitation that prevents us from being ready for us to apply to our patients at this point in time.